Hi everyone, this is Joe Huggins sitting in for Adam Hoffberg with uh, Rocky Mountain Short Takes on Suicide Prevention. And today we're having a conversation with Evan Pless. Evan, well, I'm going to let him introduce himself. He gave a talk at the Rocky Mountain Myrick not too long ago on suicide and long-term care that I thought was really interesting and not something we hear much about at all. So welcome, Evan. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks so much for having me. So I'm Evan Pliss. I'm a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus, and I specialize in mental health and aging. And within that, I really focus on long-term care settings, assisted living, skilled nursing facilities, nursing homes. And as a juror psychologist, I look at mental health conditions and uh, interventions to improve care and quality of life, uh, which obviously suicide would fall under. So I'm really excited to talk about this topic and definitely think it's also gaining a little bit more relevancy now with COVID and we know how hard long-term care has been hit with that. So I'm excited to talk about that and thank you for bringing awareness to this population. Evan, I want to first kind of get an idea of suicide in residential settings. And I think when we're talking about residential settings, why don't we first set the stage for, for what we're talking about when we say residential setting. So yeah, tell us about that. Yeah, so thanks for bringing that up because a lot of times we group together a lot of different settings into one category and just call it residential care or long-term care. So we have a lot of different settings that we tend to group into one. So we have different levels of resident needs and different levels of support across the spectrum of long-term care. And so those are really different as far as one, the mental health needs of that population, and also the way that communities respond to those needs. So we have independent living communities, which are really similar to uh, the community, other than it's a lot of older adults living in close proximity. And the amount of services that are provided in independent living are really minimal. And typically, any type of supportive services are usually a fee for service, so individuals are paying for more support. Then we have assisted living, which provides some services. And again, we see a higher level of need with the residents there. And then we move into nursing homes, which are usually having a, a resident population with a lot more physical and cognitive needs that require around-the-clock nursing care. And so those communities are providing a lot more services. So if you think about it on a, a graph, there are, as the care needs go up, the environment provides more support for those individuals. So it really is a distinction when we talk about these types of communities to make sure that you know, we're differentiating because again, the needs and the response are gonna look really different across that spectrum. We have this continuum of care and independent living to assisted care to skilled nursing facility. Okay, so we have that, that continuum. And now the other kind of thing I want to define for the audience is, this, is suicide. And, you know, what do we mean when we say suicide or self-directed violence? And is it different in those different settings? Yeah, so a lot of people will differentiate between active and passive suicide or direct, indirect, or there's different terms that appear. I, I usually use active and passive. So active would be those self-harm behaviors, those self-destructive behaviors and acting on those, causing harm to yourself through you know, these active means. Where passive suicide would be more of, you know, there are, is a treatment that I know is life-sustaining and I'm going to no longer do that, or 
I'm no longer going to engage in the behaviors that will keep me alive. And so obviously that's a much longer course and that looks very different than more of that acute self-harm behavior. But I think as we go into, as we progress in that continuum into settings that particularly have more care and are maybe a little bit more restrictive for the individual, not just because of the community, but also because of that individual's needs. The research shows that we might be seeing a little bit more passive attempts at suicide in those settings, more like the nursing homes, than the assisted livings or independent living communities. So within the the, the living center continuum, we also have, in essence, a continuum of suicidality from a more active to perhaps a more passive. So for a person who is choosing to not participate in care or to no longer, say, uh, eat or something like that, that's going to be what we're going to call passive. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Okay, great. So now we've got our, you know, kind of our, our definitions there on the table. Can you give us an idea of what kind of issue we're looking at or kind of an idea of, of suicidality within this population, within this care group? So the, the research shows that the rates of completed suicide are either comparable or, or maybe even less compared to community living older adults when you look at the long-term care settings, particularly the assisted livings and the nursing homes. And that's for a couple of reasons, one being in a controlled environment. So having staff check on you, you know, having maybe less access to firearms. We know that in the community, um, older adults engage in more lethal forms of suicide, uh, a lot of firearm use compared to other age groups. And in the community, we see uh, higher rates of completion amongst older adults who uh, attempt suicide. So uh, in the more controlled environment of long-term care, we, it's still an issue. We still see this, although the, the ways in which individuals are going about attempting suicide or completing suicide look a little bit different. Although, you know, things like jumping, cutting, you know, thinking about what in a controlled setting, what would be what an individual might have access to is going to dictate that a little bit, but it's still definitely a, an issue and, and something that, you know, I, I wish that communities paid a little bit more attention to as far as how their screening and the policies that are in place, because it is kind of variable from setting to setting how communities are, are managing uh, risk and, and suicide attempts and, and then afterwards what they're doing with that as well. What are nursing homes doing to to address this? So the the way that typically communities will address this is kind of this tiered approach within the setting. So and and I think that this is true of uh, the way that we address suicide in a lot of different settings. And again, I'm not a, an expert on this outside of you know, skilled nursing care or assisted livings, but there are interventions that are really designed for the entire population. So maintaining activity programs and really enhancing quality of life through attempting to promote autonomy as much as possible, through providing physical spaces and programming to enhance resident quality of life across the board is one way that they're ensuring that individuals are able to engage in life in a way that's meaningful for them. There are mental health screens um, that are, are mandated, particularly in the nursing home setting. But it, as far as I know, and, and this has been updated, the, the Medicare screening process has been updated recently, and I um, admittedly haven't looked at the, the most recent screens. But up until a couple of years ago, specifically asking about suicide and suicidality wasn't included in that. So 
you know, the, I think there's a, a bit of an issue around the screening right now. Most communities will have access to mental health professionals and, but rarely embed it in that setting. So typically a list of referrals, somebody coming in as a consultant is more of the norm in these types of settings. And so then that becomes an issue of who are we referring, are we capturing, you know, these risk factors and, you know, some communities do a really great job. Some communities, particularly ones that are under-resourced, there are just issues around staffing and, you know, the, the culture of, well, I have, I have to do X, Y, and Z medically. And, you know, some of this other quality of life enhancing and mental health enhancing activities can be secondary sometimes. I think the other thing that's important to note is in assisted living, uh, they're regulated at the state level. And so what that means is there's a lot more variability um, in how assisted livings manage mental health. And also it, it means that the individual operators and the individual uh, owners of these communities have a really big impact on the quality of life and, and how mental health and suicide is managed in their setting. I mean, that's true across the board, but particularly in the assisted livings and independent living communities where there are less Medicare and federal regulations, we see a lot more room for individuals to, you know, set really uh, strong, you know, standards and policies and individuals where maybe that's not at the top of their priority list. And, and a lot of it does have to do with resources and, you know, particularly places that are understaffed, underfunded. It's really hard to, to operate those places. And and sometimes these you know, psychosocial programs that, again, are at the uh, level of addressing for all the resident population can really suffer when the funding is so low. Yeah, one of the things I thought in, in what you were just saying there that I found really interesting and something um, that is getting more and more attention is the making life meaningful has as a way to address suicide prevention and given that these are controlled you know that as an environment it's a, it's a much more enclosed space but that idea that you could make life meaningful i think a lot of times there's an idea that the nursing home is the last, our last place. And, and there's times when people, when that seems very, very hopeless. Is the, that, tell, tell, I guess, our listeners about, who may not have a good notion of what a nursing home environment is or can be and how to make that meaningful. Yeah, I think that's a really, a really good point. And, and it makes me think of, you know, like the interpersonal theory of suicide, where there are kind of these two factors of, you know, thwarted sense of belonging. So that social component, and then this perceived burden. And I, I think one of the things are, that's really intertwined with meaning and purpose is also this feeling of burden. And I've seen this come out, particularly now with COVID, because you know you've seen headlines about you know nursing homes being this last stop. I think some uh, senator or politician called it you know like heaven's knocking door or some you know something like that. But uh, you know I I think there's a lot of stigma, obviously attached to aging. You know ageism has been really highlighted, particularly now during COVID. Um, and then on top of that, we talk about individuals with, you know, significant health limitations. And so now we're adding another area of stigma. And then on top of that, we're talking about relocating to a place where you're receiving care, particularly in these assisted livings and nursing homes. And so that's even another stigma on top of that, particularly in America, where this is, you know, a very self-sustaining, autonomous, uh, driven society. And so, you know, there's a lot of uh, stigma directed at these communities and the individuals who relocate there 
are coming from the same society that we are. So there's oftentimes internalized you know, messages that, that they're uh, dealing with as well after relocation. And I think the, in, in my experience in particularly assisted living communities where I've spent most of my um, time researching individ and, and across the board for, for older adults, I mean, this is also a population that has a, amazing resiliency and wisdom. And so I think that's the part that gets lost a lot of times in these conversations because we see the vulnerability. We see the need for additional assistance to maintain you know, activities of daily living. And you know, that's the part that we see most often in the media and you know, that really shapes our, our view of these settings. And you know, we're, the, the things that get left out of that is uh, an amazing personal history of accumulation of these resiliency factors, of you know these really uh, great insights and wisdom, and you know I I think that within these communities, individuals are really engaging in great ways to help not only the other residents and the staff in there, but also to to create meaning and purpose by engaging in a lot of you know, service projects and really being continuing to be great citizens of both uh, their local community and, and the broader area in which they live. And so, you know, I think that the, the viewpoint we take in, in this vulnerability is a lot of times the, you know, the physical vulnerabilities and, and maybe even the cognitive vulnerabilities. We see higher rates of neurocognitive disorders in these settings as well. And that doesn't bleed into all other areas of life. So, the majority of uh, residents in nursing homes and assisted livings are um, continuing to you know, engage in you know, their roles and living purposeful lives and really contributing and being major you know, pillars of you know, their local communities and you know, society in general. Uh, and so that's a really important you know, thing to consider as well. And you know, individuals who are coming in with you know, pre-existing mental health conditions and who you know, are at risk to begin with. They're also entering, you know, a life stage where, you know, they might be feeling more internalized stigma as well, uh, internalized ageism, internalized ableism, and, you know, that does create additional risk factors on top of that. When you were talking, I was remembering a, a tweet I read just the other day from, from Craig Bryan, and he was saying, you know, the we have to remember, or it's helpful to remember, that people tend towards resilience, that we tend towards doing okay and doing better than expected. And I, I just remember working in a nursing home and seeing that time and again where this community was created, where people thrived and had fun and did all the things that we don't, that I think people who've never really worked there uh, never get to see and, and experience. But you, and you also kind of touched on this, transitions. That seems to be a time of heightened vulnerability or a time where there's more suicidal behavior. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so the, the research kind of shows within the first six to seven months is when we would see particularly high risk. And, and again, that's potentially facilitated by this life stressor of relocating. And there's a lot of grief that, that goes with that, you know, giving up a previous residence to move to, you know, typically downsizing as well. And then, you know, again, that reminder of, you know, vulnerabilities and the stigma that is attached to that in our society. So, you know, those are facilitating this really stressful transition for individuals and, and that might increase risk factors as well. I think what's also really important when thinking about mental health and suicide as part of that is that this intra-individual changes and, and context is really, really important. And, and I would say more important than, you know, grouping individuals into, you know, the, the transition period. 
So I think a lot of times what precipitates a move to an assisted living or a nursing home is usually a life crisis. So something like a, a really major medical event or you know, a fall or you know, something that has made it very clear to the individual and the ones around them that their previous lifestyle is really not sustainable in a safe way. A lot of times uh, relocating to these communities is also precipitated by loss in the community or in the family. You know, things like I, you know, a spouse passing away and, you know, after 50 years of marriage, now some of the vulnerabilities are, are heightened and someone's relocating to, you know, a, a different setting in, you know, assisted living or a nursing home. And so, you know, a lot of, it, it's not just solely the event of relocating, but it really is a time of immense vulnerability and immense life stressors that, you know, I would say the typical resident who is moving into these settings is dealing with a lot of different stressors kind of in a short period of time. And so it, it really creates a, a really challenging transition on top of all the stuff that's going on. Okay. So, right, there's not just the move. There's also, like you were saying, there could be grief from losing a spouse, a companion. There might, there's uh, maybe loss of physical ability. There's also financial, that moving into assisted living or long-term care brings up all sorts of financial issues. And then there's the familial issues where perhaps one member says, oh, they don't need to live there. Another one says, you know, they do need to live there. And, you know, and then there's, there could be the loss of, of pets, the, you know, the, those sorts of comfort things that, that were going on. How, in the setting then, how do, how do we work with our folks? What, what treatment is there? What, is, what can we do for, for folks in this situation? So I, I think part of that also depends on, you know, the, the cognitive ability of the, the individual, because that's really going to determine a lot of times how we address uh, mental health concerns. But as, you, as we've been talking about, you know, grief is really apparent, you know, the, the, in this transition, as is most transitions and most relocations throughout your, your life. So acknowledging that and, and being, you know, supportive of that and, you know, again, promoting these resiliency enhancing factors for all individuals. So we know that social support is a really big mediator in this relationship between you know, the stress and, and mental health. And so, you know, providing, you know, an environment that allows for, you know, social engagement, staying in touch with individuals from, you know, family in the community, friends, and also in providing, you know, new outlets for social interaction and the ability to continue roles in some way. You know, it, the there's been a lot of research around uh, cognitive behavioral therapy and other types of psychotherapies, problem solving therapies. If you know this, you know some of these conditions persist, and individuals need a little bit more support. I think the biggest thing is recognizing the stress and emotional burden uh, associated with this life stage and with this transition. And so, having staff be sensitive to that, having individuals in that person's life be sensitive to that and allowing the individual to access those strengths that they've built up. As you said, most people are resilient and most people are resistant to you know, these serious mental health concerns. And that doesn't mean that they don't experience down points and that they don't experience you know, heightened levels of uh, stress and, and burden and grief. Um, and so normalizing that and also Allowing people uh, to connect with their strengths is, is really key at a lot of different levels and a lot of different uh, stakeholders are involved in, in doing that and, and facilitating that for the individual. Mm. Yeah, I really like 
the the response there that it's not just well we'll have you know by a weekly counseling session but it's this social milieu it's a lot of people working together creating again that environment of support and and care and that and bringing the family in and you know being all in this in this together are there examples that 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 you've seen or a story that you can relate for the audience about when you've seen this come together in such a way that you know really really worked like as far as someone coming in with the like coming in with mental health concerns or having yeah that and then you know somebody like maybe who came in and I remember times where somebody came in after their their spouse had died. They'd been together decades, and the family was so very worried that this person would just fall apart without without their spouse. And the Unfortunately, the the family and the physician were like, "Well, let's let's start them on on some medication. Let's, you know, really, we just don't think they're going to do well." And that did not seem to be the case. You know, the structure of the environment, the finding out that the person down the hall also liked reading westerns that these little things that that we didn't think of at first became you know the things that propped them up that made you know them happy you know so i remember a lot of those kinds of stories and feel free to and i make them up when i have to no you know this this idea that is not all doom and gloom. Right. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that makes me think of someone that I met in actually a, a research capacity who uh, transitioned to an assisted living community and um, was really, you know, struggling with some grief and, you know, was saying that the first, particularly the first month was really challenging and noting that there were a lot of these indicators that life had changed. And to be in that acute phase of all of these transitions happening, you know, there was a loss in the family precipitating this. And then, you know, just noticing these changes in routine were really stressful. And then at mealtime, because I, I think mealtime is where a lot of individuals get socialization and, you know, get to meet new people. This resident found, found another person who they really bonded over their love of photography. And so they talked about it and, you know, as they, you know, build this relationship and start it to, you know, um, engage in some of these behaviors together that were, you know, this continuity of roles and pleasant activities and just, you know, through the adaptation process, you know, this person's mood was um, improving. And then they met with the activities director and they said, well, you know, we know that there are other people here that really like photography. We want to start a photography club. And so they, you know, together ran this activity and more individuals joined. And then I remember they actually had a, an art show that I was, I was lucky enough to be invited to. I, I couldn't attend, but they, you know, had individuals from the community, family members, staff come and look at uh, their photography. And so... Uh, it was this really great example of even without, you know, mental health intervention, that, you know, facilitating and, and being able to just, you know, pull upon these strengths and this natural human resiliency to not only improve the individual circumstance, but also to make an impact in the community by, you know, starting this new activity, having new, you know, other residents join, facilitating new social connections. 
and then also having an impact on the broader community where you know staff were able to you know engage in interaction in a different way at this art show and there was you know this new ability to engage with you know staff and family in the community that you know here's something that we created and you know the everyone was brought together for this event and so i think that's a, a really nice example of you know how you know it's not just individual resiliency but there's a, a community as well that benefits from you know residents and the amazing things that they do mm -hmm. right so when mental health becomes com a, a community well-being rather than this individual act between one person and another so evan as we kind of wind down here, is there something that I've missed here along the way that you want to make sure that we uh, chat about or that our audience hears about? So I know that you talked about this being, you know, more like generalized and not like COVID specific. Would it be okay if we talked a little bit about, you know, what could potentially be heightened yeah, uh, yeah. mental health stuff with COVID? Yes, yes, please do. Okay. So I think obviously right, right now, long-term care communities are getting a lot of attention from the media for being, you know, kind of at the, the center of, of COVID and having a lot of COVID-related uh, cases and deaths. Um, and I think that's created a really uh, major stress on that whole system. Obviously, the individual, the residents who are experiencing really heightened stress right now and worry about their health, and same with the, the staff who, in general, are not particularly valued from a societal standpoint, and we're seeing that now, especially, and you know the family members as well. So there's just a lot of stress on this system. And, you know, obviously we don't have data yet on the mental health impacts or particularly around suicide in long-term care communities right now, other than some anecdotal, you know, stories in the media. But there, there was a, a study that I, I've been going back to and, and reading kind of over and over again, because I think it was such a great piece and I, and it's, I think it's really powerful. It was by a scholar in, in Hong Kong you know, 10 years ago now, but it was SARS outbreak. And they found that there was a, a significant increase in uh, completed suicides amongst older adults following the SARS um, outbreak there. And so these researchers did this study where they used a lot of different methods to really try to see what was going on in a lot of those cases. So they interviewed people, they looked for any notes, any correspondences that they could gather, they gained objective data. And so they, they really tried to figure out, you know, what was going on that led to this significant increase in completed suicides. And they, they boiled it down to these um, four factors that I think are really relevant to a long-term care setting. The first was an increased fear of contracting the illness, which Obviously, I think, you know, most people are, are experiencing that and, and that's, you know, heightened in long-term care communities given, you know, the prevalence there. And so, you know, behaviors like really, ex, you know, excessive worry about health, you know, these excessive cleaning behaviors, you know, this also this perceived burden around, you know, seeing themselves as, you know, someone who is being a hindrance to their family, to their community, and to society, and also indicated by increased media consumption. So we already know that particularly in nursing homes and assisted livings, a lot of residents will spend their time watching television. And so, you know, what's on TV right now? And so that, you know, I think that's another area where we need to be aware. You know, some of the other contributing factors to this sample who who completed suicide related to SARS was, you know, social isolation, disrupted activities. So, you know, I had this routine uh, that was pleasant for me and now, you know, that's gone for the foreseeable future. We don't know how long. And then increased medical burden. So obviously, you know, as 
you know, individuals with significant physical health limitations, mental health can exacerbate a lot of these symptoms like pain, sleep. And so, you know, together, this creates a really challenging situation for individuals' mental health. And, you know, this study, and I think there's also issues, you know, comparing cross-cultural um, studies around uh, suicide. But, you know, what we can gather from this, the take home is that, you know, there are increased risks right now. And, you know, particularly the individuals who maybe had those risk factors before um, and were at risk, you know, you're adding a lot of stress right now. And so I think that now is really the time to, to have this conversation around mental health and safety around mental health, particularly for self-harming behaviors in this population, because they, the individuals who are, were at risk are really at risk, particularly now. And, and so I, I, I keep going back to this study as, you know, this really great scholarship to think about, you know, how do we address this? And, you know, the burden isn't on the individual even to address this. Uh, it's not just, oh, well, this person needs to get mental health support or this person needs to, you know, get their stuff together there's there we're all kind of in this together and we're all stakeholders in mental health and safety for i mean the population but you know it you know for what i'm talking about for residents in long-term care communities particularly nursing homes and assisted livings and so you know there is the the access you know our community is set up and equipped to facilitate telehealth services are they screening and making sure that they're identifying those individuals who could really benefit from telehealth services right now? And how do you differentiate, you know, who's at acute risk and who's not and, and who's making those decisions? And so that's really at the, you know, administrative level. Are, are we making sure that environments are safe right now? You know, are, you know, are we taking extra precautions for safety again at that administrative level? I think the staff really, I, it's a really challenging situation right now because all contact is limited. And so, you know, we're not having a lot of face-to-face -face interactions and we're, you know, getting our care tasks done and getting out of there, you know, meaning the, the residents room and, you know, the staff interactions. You know, how are we ensuring that we're asking the right questions we're allowing individuals to, you know, be screened and to, you know, make sure that we're identifying risk appropriately at that staff level. You know, same with family. What's the stream of communication there? You know, what's the level of knowledge and education that we're giving individuals? When we know from previous disasters, when individuals don't have good knowledge about what's going on, mental health risks increase. So, you know, there's a lot of stakeholders in this and then, you know, broadly society around, you know, changing the narrative of, you know, I've, I've been really concerned and upset with a lot of the uh, portrayal of, you know, the reopening around COVID with, it, it almost feels like we're pitting old, older adults or other individuals who are at risk for developing COVID versus the economy and it's like one or the other and so you know going back to that study in Hong Kong you know there is this perceived burden on society and so how do we change that narrative because it's not one or the other you know it's not us versus them you know my economic well-being versus you know someone who has uh, chronic and serious illness their you know health you know, it, it, it doesn't have to be an either or. I mean, I think the, the narrative and the conversation sometimes feels that way. And so, you know, I think that there's, you know, at any time there are multiple stakeholders in ensuring, you know, safety and access to mental health. And I think right now is a really important time to, you know, think about all those levels and what can we do to make sure that we're, you know, giving individuals the best chance to, you know, have access to mental health care, to have conversations about that. And, you know, we write individuals off, I think, a lot of times in these communities as physically vulnerable and we address, address their physical vulnerabilities. And we know that, you know, that is very 
strongly tied to mental health. And I think now is a really important time to, to be focusing on mental health in um, long-term care communities. I, I second that. And I mean, one of the, as we spoke earlier, you talked a lot about the, this, the building of community, building this, this milieu that was, was protective. But now with COVID, in a way tearing at that fabric of community, that the vulnerability increases significantly. Certainly the idea of, of us or them hurts a lot and makes that, that feeling of burdensomeness stronger. I do want to say, we also touched real quickly a role that telehealth can play in this. And so I want to just make a quick plug. My other halftime job is with, with what the VA calls the GRAC, which is a Geriatric Research Education and Clinical Centers. And they focus on research and education and clinical stuff related to our, our elderly population, of which I'm one. And they have a program called GREC Connect, which does telehealth services, especially to rural settings, rural long-term care settings and such. And we'll have a link on the webpage that accompanies this podcast. So just a chance to to say a little bit about that, so forgive me that. Okay, so you know, you, you've you kind of put in front of us that to not forget in, in right now with the this pandemic going on, in essence, if we get away from the things that work, building community, having the social milieu that is supportive, that it's getting away from that that potentially will lead, could lead to more suicide attempts. Am I getting that right? Absolutely. And also making sure that you know we're, we're screening and that we're opening a platform for these conversations because I think that also is potentially at risk. I, I've been pleased that a lot of, there's have been a lot of conversation around mental health and suicide. And, you know, when it's coming from a, a staff member who might be, you know, engaging in face-to-face -face contact and trying to limit that, you know, this isn't, a, it's not a, a typical question of, so are you going to kill yourself? No? Okay, cool. Like, that's not usually how these conversations go. And so making sure that individuals are, you know, the, the whole system is trained and that there are appropriate outlets to engage in those conversations to really facilitate good screening and good, you know, referral of resources and, and connecting people with the help they need. Okay, so I'm going to put you on the spot here just a wee bit. And so if that's not the right conversation, this kind of just quick one off. How, what is a, a better way to, to do that? So I, I think particularly with older adults where there is a lot of stigma around mental health, it's really important to, to think about how you're phrasing these types of questions in this conversation. So I usually will lead in with, you know, asking about kind of general physical health, kind of general well-being, and it really is a, a conversation. You know, it's not uh, this, you know, these really hard and fast, you know, questions in and out around, you know, mental health, because I think there is particularly um, in older cohorts still a, very much a stigma around mental health and mental health treatment. So I think, you know, having trusted conversations, building rapport, and, you know, leading into, you know, asking about mood and burden and hopefulness and thinking about the future. And, you know, then, you know, transitioning into, well, I mean, if you're feeling hopeless, have you ever 
thought about harming yourself or ending your life, you know, as, you know, just part of this natural conversation rather than, you know, I think younger generations might be a little bit more socialized to those type of screening questions, although there, you know, obviously still stigma generally, but I think particularly with uh, older adults, it's really important to, you know, have trust before um, asking anything about mental health. Right, taking some time and building that rapport, building that trust, as you say. I can see that that becomes more and more important. And probably just not a bad idea for all of us to do with each other, no matter what. <laughs> These skills are definitely generalizable. <laughs> right, yeah, okay. Well, thank you, Evan, for this this conversation to, today. And it's a topic I'd like to keep exploring because, again, I think it's something that, you know, so much goes unsaid, probably too much goes unsaid. And this long-term care for us or our parents or some other loved one is something that I think most of us will face at one time or another. And, and again, it's not a conversation that I, I feel gets address much in our field of suicide prevention. So I'd love to to bring you back and and continue the conversation. Would that work for you? Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. And like I am so appreciative that you're allowing me to have this platform, but also, you know, that you're recognizing this population and having these conversations, because I, I do think that oftentimes the, the narrative is either I don't think about you know, individuals who are older and have you know, health conditions, physical and mental health conditions, or it's that, well, their life's over anyway, why even bother? And I think that you know, I, I, I think having these conversations and also sharing you know, that we've, we talked about some of the positive experiences that we've had both, you know, on the podcast and even before. And, you know, I think that just continuing to have those conversations is so important for, you know, society in general. And so thank you for allowing me this platform. And I would love to come back at any time, seriously. Okay, cool. Yeah, that'll be great. And, and thank you very much for, for this time today and also for tying it back into this the contemporary time of, of COVID and, and what that means. Well, folks, thank you for tuning in once again to the Rocky Mountain Short Takes on suicide prevention. We'd love to have feedback from you. Love to hear your thoughts on this topic and to let us know what other things you'd like us to explore. You, on, our, on the webpage that's accompanying this podcast, There'll be a link where you can give us your ideas and tell us what y'all think. Feel free to give us a, ring, a rating if you'd like uh, to mention us to your friends. And as always, we love to hear from, hear about stories of resilience and you know, uplifting of us all. Thanks again. Take care.